fighting for the little guy. Even though I look like Goliath, I'm really David in this story. <laughs> that video made and when you, that video you made about being the uh, about it being the greatest job in the world, I've decided to take the leap and I really want to do it now and go full time and it's so freaking cool. And I thought how many dollars? I mean, I started doing the math. The insurance company was saving by hiring these, you know, new adjusters and then auditing them, auditing them and correcting some of their work. How many millions of dollars people didn't get in that storm because of the way the system is designed. And I wanted to be on the other side of that system. Nice. I'm sure you'd freaking crush it in a deposition when an attorney is asking you about the price per shingle. I'm sure you'd sort of laugh yeah. at them and tell them, <laughs> okay. Like and um, right. and then eventually you settle. So especially if you've done the roof already, what happens is, is a year down the road or a year and a half down the road, you get a call from the attorney say, hey, Paul, we got to check for you. I saw the anger and the hurt and the brokenness in the people. And I said, man, I don't want to be this guy. I don't want to work for insurance companies when they're, they're um, they're following the law in, in North Carolina, but the laws have need to be rewritten. So that's the biggest thing that we're seeing right now with all the um, the new codes that hit this January, that uh, if they don't have the policy the right way, um, then they're not getting enough money from their insurance company. So it's a real time uh, that people need help and they really do need uh, insurance adjusters, public adjusters badly right now in this Pensacola area. So there's more storms that are hitting America uh, than ever before and they're doing worse damage and it gets worse every year. And so it, it's not about when, it's a, it, I mean, it's not about if, it's about when. So you need to be prepared. And man, I actually had someone you know, write me and say that they were thinking about taking their life and then they saw one of my videos. And on that day, it just changed their perspective and they were able to make it through and to get some help and start trying to, to work through and do better. And for me, it doesn't get any better than that. That's like the highest level of like, of living for me is to help somebody that's hurting that way. What's up, advocates? And welcome back to another episode of the Claims Game Podcast. We've got an amazing one today, like I always say, but this time I mean it, which I meant it before, but seriously, it's a great episode today. Uh, but before I get into it, uh, just know that we are sponsored by Fortez Health. Fortez Health is an amazing company where you can get all of your PPE products, masks, gloves, face masks, and all kinds of stuff, even for like, I don't know, gowns and stuff to protect you. Really not only for COVID, but if you're a mold uh, person and you listen to the show, this could be a good place to get some of your equipment or just public adjusters in general. Again, even if it's not COVID, if you're going into a house, it's got a lot of mold and all kinds of stuff, it's still good to have a mask on. If you put in Vince 20 at checkout, you'll get 20% off. So give that a shot. Anyway, today, such a special guest. Paul Bryan. Paul Bryan is a roofer. Paul Bryan is a roofer in the Pensacola area. Paul Bryan has been working Hurricane Sally now for the last, I guess, almost a year now. Well, not a year. It's been about four or five months now. Uh, just crazy, just replacing roofs. One thing I love about Paul Bryan he's a real, is he's a real advocate for the policyholder. Okay, he's a roofer going in there with people who have been underpaid. And he's doing what he can to put together exactimate estimates and presenting it to the insurance company and saying, hey, I'm a roofer and you owe this much money. And he's a real advocate. Uh, I met him in Pensacola and we had an amazing connection. Uh, the guy is a world traveler. Uh, he is six foot eight. He has a beard down to about his belly button. And uh, he has over 100,000 followers on TikTok. That's right. He made a bet with his daughter that he would get over 100,000 followers in like a certain amount of time. And he did it. He's just a cool guy. Uh, like I said, he's traveled the world. Uh, he's very is he's all about where we me and him connected is we're all about helping others and doing what we can to help others and just sort of the whole karmic life where if you do better for others, it will turn out good for you. And that's just how he is. Uh, he's got if you go to Viking Tower on TikTok, you can see all of his really cool videos. Uh, Viking Tower One on Instagram. Uh, he's got his own brand now called Unicorn, where he's got shirts that say One Voice One love one race that's the kind of guy he is and that's why me and him connected so much and uh, we have a great conversation we talk about all of it we talk about the hurricane we talk about roofs we talk about insurance adjusters and we talk about one love one race traveling the world doing what we can to give back to others and uh he's just an awesome guy i think you're gonna love this one we talk about his tiktok and everything so it's really not only about roofing and uh, and, and adjusting and, and insurance claims it's actually a lot about life so I think you're gonna love it. So without further ado, my man, Paul Bryan. Welcome to the Claims Game Podcast with Vince Perry. Get 
all the tips you need from insurance claim advocates and professionals and grow your public adjusting career to the next level. And now the commercial claims advocate, Vince Perry. All right, we are here with one of my favorite people. One of my favorite people is Paul Bryan. What's up, Paul? It's good to be here with you. <laughs> and the hey, reason- man, How's it going? It's good to be with you, Vince. The reason why Paul is one of my favorite people is the funny thing is we've only met one time, but we had such a great conversation at just a little Starbucks, having a couple cups of coffee. I mean, we talked about roofing. We talked about claims. We talked about life. We talked about South America. We talked about <laughs> homeless kids in South America. We talked right. about- all, we talked about the freaking Bible. We talked about <laughs> love, and uh, and it was awesome, man. So thank you for coming on with me, man. That's right. You got a good memory, man. Hell yeah, I got a good memory. How, yeah, it was how awesome. Can, how can I forget a conversation like that? It's not every day <laughs> that you connect with people. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, man. And uh, I knew right away you're good people, man. That's what the kind of people I like to deal with. Right. People who are passionate, people who uh, who just believe in what they're saying, people who aren't completely full of shit. That's right. And, uh, and I, I just think that, you know, I feel like you're a kind of person, um, even as a roofer or whatever it is, you're definitely the kind of person that that is passionate about what you do. And you know that you're helping people. And uh, I think we can oh, both absolutely. agree that if we're living a life of service, of helping others, it just makes our life a lot better. Yeah, I've never um, read about somebody that was um, made an impact in the world that didn't mentor other people and didn't share that experience and didn't help other people get to where they're at. And so my whole motto is, is if I can help enough people get to where they need to be and help them with their life, then I'm going to go where I need to be and I'm going to it's going to be good karma or whatever you want to call it. If you're if you're doing the right things and you have the right heart, then you're going to be successful. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I mean, for for years, it's so funny. I was actually telling my wife yesterday, I was a tennis coach teaching nice. kids for 15 years. So after I finished my playing days, played college tennis for, for a couple of years, and it was the best job in the world while I was in college was just teaching kids. But it turned out to like sort of a career. And from the age of 17 to about 32 years old, I was teaching tennis out in the course every single day teaching kids some adults here and there but mainly it was kids from six years old to about 18 years old and when i moved to tampa nice. when i moved to tampa i stopped teaching completely and i went public adjusting full time and i decided to start this um this podcast and and then i decided to turn the podcast into like education educating other public adjusters and now i find myself again just a few years later three or four years later teaching again teaching other public adjusters now to become better public adjusters and i have just found that it's just it's just very it's very rewarding it's a lot of work but it's rewarding yeah you have a gift you know and you find that that gift yeah that gift rises to the top I um I taught uh, in a corporate environment and did a lot of public speaking and uh, then I got into ministry and I taught all over the world and then you know whatever job you, you find yourself or whatever position now I spend a lot of my time going around and helping people with their insurance claims and teaching them how to you know read their policy or read their claim and read what the insurance company sent to them it's really unfair that the insurance companies put everything in a language that nobody understands unless you have a license. It's unfair. It should be illegal. It should be in plain English, but it's not. And that's why they need people like you and I to help them out. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I was going through a policy with other public adjusters just yesterday and they, you could just, even me reading through it, I've read, I've read through hundreds of these things and it's still even complicated for me. So imagine <laughs> just your normal homeowner. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to find little tips and tricks to help them out with it. And, you know, I find people a lot, they're saying, this is my first home. I've never had a policy before. And then I've never been hit by a hurricane before. And so there's a lot of first time buyers in the market who are literally, if they don't have a dad or mom to call and sometimes they call their mom or dad and their mom or dad calls me and you because they don't they still don't know just because you're a mom or a dad doesn't mean you know how to do everything so it is very rewarding fighting with the insurance companies and making sure that the insured gets what they're supposed to get fighting for the little guy even though i look like goliath i'm really david in this story <laughs> i love it i love it what are some of the things so you're in pensacola 
you're you're i remember you telling me you're not a, you're not originally from pensacola but you live in pensacola now right navarre, and, yeah in navarre and uh i mean i guess i guess by by luck in a way we got this hurricane hurricane sally that hit back in september and um you know what's what's been the uh what's what's it been like since september since hurricane sally hit pensacola well it's been we got 2,000 calls for the roofing company within the first three days. Wow. Uh, we were getting 50 calls a day for months. Um, it's still very busy. Now what we're seeing is a big influx of people who got their insurance check, uh, but it's nowhere near what it needs to, ha to have to put a roof on. So they don't know understand um, ACV value and RCV value. They don't know that they're going to be able to write a supplement. Most people over 99%, really, I mean, over, over a good 98, 99% of the people I talk to don't even know what a supplement is. And when they train you, when you go to adjusting school, when you get trained by uh, some big insurance company, they tell you, well, the person will just write a supplement. Uh, so you only write for what you see. Well, the problem with that is, is that 99% of people don't know what a supplement is. And so they don't even know how to read how much money, if they've got multiple items like fencing and they've got interior damage and they've got exterior damage and lights and all of this, they can, they look at what their insurance company sends them and they don't even know how much money goes for the roof. And so it's just a really difficult time for people. But um, because of that, we get a lot of calls and we're able to sit down and meet with a lot of people um, and help them understand what, what's going on. But my biggest disappointment in the insurance industry right now is that almost every single one, probably greater than 90% of the time, it's not enough money to put a roof on, even if you were getting a discounted cash price. And so the insurance companies are not writing, uh, of course they don't write for anything that's not incurred, so they're not writing for the law and ordinance codes, and it's just not enough money. And if the people, uh, heaven forbid, don't have the right policy, they don't have law and ordinance coverage, insurance companies are not wanting to even give them enough money to put a roof on, which is a real shame when they've been paying their premium, you know, however many years. So that's the biggest thing that we're seeing right now with all the um, the new codes that hit this January, that uh, if they don't have the policy the right way, um, then they're not getting enough money from their insurance company. So it's a real time uh, that people need help and they really do need uh, insurance adjusters, public adjusters badly right now in the Spencicola area. What's some of the, what's some of the, what is, what's, what's the percentage you would say of people without law and ordinance coverage who actually need to do these code upgrades? <laughs> Uh, I'm not running into it uh, t too terribly much. I think probably 15% um, don't have, uh, you know, it's supposed to be uh, um, offered to everyone. And I think there's a box they check saying they denied the coverage, but they really don't even know what the coverage is. When I talk to people, they don't know what law and ordinance is. When I ask them, I said, do you know if you have law and ordinance coverage? Well, I don't even know what that is. Right. And sometimes on a policy, it's one line that is about the size of, if you're over 40, you can't read it anyway, with the help of a 12 year old or some glasses. And I call my kids in and say, hey, what does this say? And it's usually the instructions on medicine, but it's that small of a line. And it says you have law and ordinance coverage or that you decline law and ordinance coverage. And so anybody that's listening, that's not involved in insurance, they ought to always, everybody ought to have law and ordinance coverage because the, the codes change all the time in Florida. And every time a code changes, it makes it more expensive to do the thing that we used to do because we're doing it in a better way or in a more expressed way. So it's still about 15%. And of the 85% that do have it, the insurance companies are still not writing for the full, what a roof costs. So. Right. What are some of the, what, what are they writing up for in regards to, I guess, some prices uh, for, for roofs? What are, what are they writing up? What are they writing up for compared to the price that actually needs to be paid for in order to replace these roofs? Okay, so I don't know a roofer, and now we're talking about like a four or five, uh, maybe six over 12 pitch roof. We're talking about um, shingles, okay? And um, the prices have gone up, the price of labor has gone up, the shingles are scarce. The price of you know keeping crews and, and your teams that you've had and having good help has gone up. And so uh, the bottom price for like a 612 or below roof is 360, 365 a square. Now, now go back before the storm, that, that number was like two, 265 to 325, depending on the company who did the work. So now, now we're looking at the base is 360 and it's going up to 425. And uh, you're just talking about, you know, good quality shingle, uh, all the upgrades are being done, all the codes are being followed. So we're nowhere near at 325 is what the insurance companies are writing for. There's nobody, I don't know anybody that is a, a um, roofing company that's been in business, that's worth their salt, that has good reviews on Google, that has good reviews with Better Business Bureau, that's putting a roof on for less than 360 a square. 
So now these customers are getting, you know, paperwork saying, okay, we're going to give you 360 a square. And they've got estimates from us and three or four other roofers. And it's at 400 a square or 425 a square. And the insurance companies are coming back to them and saying, hey, we want you to put um, an itemized list together of what you're charging us. When I put an itemized list together, it's three or four grand more than even what I did. And so <laughs> exactly. they're saying, what are you doing? Right. I'm saying, this is an itemized list. Now, most roofers can't put together an itemized list because they don't use Xactimate like I right. do because I was an adjuster. Right. So, um, so now they want to have an itemized. So it costs us more money to have itemized listing. And it costs us more time because we have to track the checks and we have to track everything that we're doing. I had to hire a full-time assistant just to keep up with everything. And then they want to lowball us on the price of the roofs after they ask for us to give them more. And I've never seen a storm where the insurance companies are requiring so much information to get a, a client paid. It's wrong and it should be illegal. And I hope something is done after this storm to stop it from happening going forward. How many people do you see getting underpaid? Percentage wise, 95 or better, 95 better or percent. Um, I've only seen actually I can say it's higher than that because I've only seen one actual report from an insurance company where an adjuster came out, somebody that was experienced that wrote for the law and ordinance. Maybe they read their policy and knew they need be nailing, et cetera, and actually gave them about 365, 370 a square. And I was like, oh, well, you don't need my help at all. I mean, this is this is fair and we can do the roof for this price. Boom. You know, takes all that out of the way, having to um, go back and forth with the insurance companies. And then it's a done deal. And if everybody operated that way, then it would be a much easier process for everybody involved. But because it's not, then people need people like you for sure. And me. And how's how's it going with the supplements? How's that going? How's the supplement life? Uh, are you actually getting any results? Decent results? It's good. Um, I um. <laughs> It is. It's super slow. Um, it's amazing how quickly that people get a first check, but how slowly they get a second. Check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. I've got, yeah. I mean, I've got uh, probably seventy-five cases that are personally in working myself, and um, of those, uh, maybe we've done let's say twenty-five of the roofs. We've probably gotten full payment on like three or four. Oh no! Yeah, and we're and we're and it's a slow process. So we're in the process of getting paid, but. You know, we have to write the supplement. The best thing to do, and uh, you know, we learn from every storm, is I try to go ahead and get the um, supplement in right away and get our estimate in and then settle the claim for a dollar amount that we both agree on so that the checks can come quicker. And those those checks are coming much quicker. Right, right. Yeah. All right, so um, so what's your process like then, uh, Paul? You, 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 Somebody calls you because they've been severely underpaid. This is how right. I'm gonna assume it goes, right? And they yeah. say, hey, I need an estimate because I need an estimate to pro uh, provide to my insurance company. Uh, yeah. You, Let's say you forget any kind of contracts or anything, but you provide an estimate to the insurance company and you request a supplement. I'm assuming sometimes they send uh, somebody out to do a reinspection. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, uh, but What's it like? Why is it why is it that only five or ten out of the seventy five you've actually received the payment? What, what's where, where are you at in the process in some of these with the supplement? Uh, supplement has been uh, presented to the insurance company, and the insurance company sends it to somebody's desk, a desk adjuster, and then a desk adjuster will call and find out why the prices are the prices that they are, and then they will either approve or disapprove. And honestly, almost every insurance company that we worked with here has been super easy to work with, but about five. There's a handful that are terrible in this storm that I think will have some class action lawsuits that will come out of it. Um, there's some really people who are really upset because their insurance companies are making the process so difficult. Um, but to your to your question, if someone calls me and says, hey, man, I've been severely underpaid. And we, sometimes we sign a contract with them, sometimes we don't, depends on where we are in the process. We may already have a contract on a roof or a, a, a price. Uh, sometimes we don't have a contract and then I can sign the contract that'll let me um, work with their insurance company. Then I present what we would call an estimate, which is, uh, you know, is the first offer of this is what everything would be when it's itemized, this is how much we want for the roof. And in every case, the insurance company, it goes up the ladder to somebody that has X, Y, Z authority, and they say, okay, we're not going to do, we're not paying for line two, 12, 16, eight. That's not part of the policy or that's not what we, we're going to pay for. And then will you accept this amount? And then we just kind of go from there. Sometimes we can't accept that amount and sometimes we can't budge on, 
on it because everything that we've asked for is actually what we need to do the roof, depending on the market, the pitch, you know, two story, it's on the beach, no access, uh, having to carry him, carry everything to the roof. There's just a lot of things going on right now. That's not normal because of COVID and because of um, when the hurricane hit. See, we follow an appraisal. I like to just go straight to appraisal on that shit, to be honest, just go straight to appraisal. We send an appraisal appraisal request and if the policy states that they have to abide by it then um, they are forced to basically name their appraiser within 20 days and if they don't name it within 20 days we could we could report them to the state um another thing that we do is after they do name the appraiser if now if the appraiser has to be agreed upon and they are going to just completely reject our appraisal request then we actually go to a mediation uh we schedule a mediation funny thing about mediation is that once a mediation is scheduled they have 21 days to resolve the case with you if they don't resolve the case within 21 days they only have an additional 24 days which is 45 days total to actually complete the mediation and the See, that's fantastic. Me- that's fantastic. I just got one uh, request this week or one notification that we're going to mediation and I could pick the um, umpire or whatever, uh, but I, I didn't really care because I don't know any of the umpires here, but all of them seem like they would be reasonable. Well, that's, a, um, that's appraisal. Yeah, that. Okay. That's, a pra- that's appraisal. Okay. That's appraisal. And you could probably be the appraiser on it. Um, I don't know what the laws are behind that, but I'm pretty sure you could be the appraiser on it. If you could just, uh, if the, as long as the client names you as the appraiser, uh, and if you, and if you have any trouble with the umpire, let's send it to me. Okay. Send it to me. I'll let Absolutely. you know. I'll let you know who to pick and, or, or who not, or who I'll let you know who not to pick too, because you've got some umpires that, you know, they're, I'll they're send fair. You an email after we get off of here. I'll yeah, send you an email you, on it. You've got some umpires who are fair, who are very down the middle, and you've got some umpires that are just in the pockets of the insurance company. But the beauty about the, the that whole appraisal process is number one, when you meet the appraiser out there, they don't have any kind of limitations. The good part with the appraiser is, um, although they are being sent by the insurance company, so technically they do work for the insurance company, so they may have some limitations here and there because they want to continue to get chosen as the right. appraiser. Sure. Uh, they Whatever they say, it's final. It's not like when you meet uh, a field adjuster out at the property That's and the field adjuster and the field adjuster puts an estimate together for $100,000, sends it to the desk adjuster and cuts it down to $10,000. The appraiser, if he puts an estimate for $100,000, that's exactly what needs to be paid for. And nice. the appraiser is usually much more experienced. Usually they're former contractors or they've got some construction experience. So you can really get into the nuts and bolts of what needs to be done and why it needs to be done. And there's probably a way, probably shouldn't say this on the podcast, but I don't care. You could tell them, hey, these people don't have law and ordinance. It's gonna cost them this much money to do all these things. Why don't you kick up that per square price a little bit right? so that they can cover that stuff. You know what I'm saying? You go back and forth with the appraiser yeah, and you absolutely. can usually get somewhere. If you don't now, have, have you gone to appraisal before? No, this is my first time. All right. So then now, so you're, you're meeting with them. They're going to put their own estimate. You're going to present them your estimate. You have to go out there and meet them at the property so you can show them everything that's included in your estimate and why. If I were you, I'd print that motherfucker out and go line item by line item to make yeah, sure, sure, hey, this is why I'm doing this. And they'll yeah. put together what they put together. Build a good, strong relationship with them, which I know you're good at. And then they'll put their estimate together and they'll send it to you and say, hey, here's where I'm at. You've got a little bit of room to negotiate there, too. So if your estimate's at 100 grand and the appraiser comes back and say 80, 85 grand, say, hey, where, where are we different? I may not need 100 right. grand, but I want you to get a little bit closer than 80. And then he'll see what he yeah, can yeah, do. Yeah. More right. often than not, me personally, I usually settle with the appraiser 85 to 90% of the time. Yeah. If you don't agree, warn the client, you may want to cover this fee, but technically it's not a fee that you should be covering. If you do go to the umpire, that fee for the umpire is usually about thir- about three thousand dollars or so, and it's split 50 50 between the insurance company and the insured. So you might want to let the client know that if okay. that if you don't agree with the opposing appraiser, that the umpire does come at a cost. But you have to understand that if you're at a hundred and the appraiser comes in at fifty, that fifteen hundred is going to be worth it because you know you'll be able to get to, to the number that you want to. Okay. Which is the reason why you want to choose an umpire that is uh, that is fair because you could get burned because what happens is after the appraisal and after the umpire whatever the umpire says that's it claim is done claim is over you can't even file a lawsuit. Wow. Okay. 
So this is your last <laughs> chance. But I like it though because it's more relationship based. It's worked great for me. Uh, even though I'm not nearly as knowledgeable as you are on roofing systems and contracting, I've built such good relationships with a lot of the appraisers on the other side that when I do present my estimate to get to them, I'm usually able to get what I want. And I know a lot of the umpires on the other side too, and usually able to get sort of what we want and negotiate a little bit, have a little wiggle room, but we get what we want. So good luck with that. That'll be fun. Send me that umpire list. I want to see Thanks, it. Thanks, man. No, I will send it to you for sure. Yeah. So, and those other ones that you've got a lot of trouble on, you know, you've got to start maybe thinking about not necessarily just hiring a public adjuster, but maybe even filing a lawsuit or, or recommending that they file a lawsuit on some of those. Yeah. So how does that process work? Like um, if they're dragging their feet to get paid and they haven't paid um, and you've sent several requests and they've told you, oh, it's at a desk adjuster now. Oh, yeah, we kicked it back out. Now Sally's got it. We fired that person. Now there's someone else who's working on this. <laughs> yes, we've got your supplement. And it's been two months. What's the next step to um to make the insurance company pay? Right. So you could go ahead and you could file that appraisal. That's one thing you can do. I would recommend that you do that. That's what I would do. Um, I mean, the thing- work's already done, though. Everything's already done. The roof's on. Wow. And they're just not responding at all. Well, I mean, it's it's very rare, but it does happen sometimes where they're, you know, we've put the new roof on, we've sent the certificate of completion, we've sent the final invoice, we've sent the supplement, and they're just dragging their feet paying it. Yeah. Um, the different, you the supplement doesn't work, then you have to go, that's obviously, that's, that's basically plan A. Uh, the next one is you have one of two things that you can do. You could either go ahead and request the appraisal, okay, and see if they accept it or not. And if they don't, then you can file for mediation. And mediation is very easy to file in the state. You just go to the, um, uh, honestly, you could just Google search file mediation, Florida, yeah. and it'll take you right through it. Okay. And then, like I said, they've got some time limits there with the mediation and you can try to settle in mediation. So the difference, the biggest difference between appraisal and mediation in appraisal, once that decision is made, the claim is done and you can't go any further. So if you don't get what you want with the umpire, you're screwed in mediation. You could sit down in a mediation, and if you guys don't agree, you could still go ahead and file a lawsuit. Okay. Um, what the lawyers usually do, usually they want to take on a case that's like, you know, they've been ignoring you. They're not paying what you're supposed to, what, what you're requesting. You've got a certificate of completion. You've got everything there, and they're still just sort of dragging their feet, uh, then you want to get a lawyer involved. And what they'll usually do is they'll file a document, well, not a document, like an online document called a civil remedy notice. Okay, it's a a CRN. And that civil remedy notice basically puts them on notice that, hey, an attorney's involved, okay, and you've basically slipped up on all these different things. I've got emails sent by my roofer basically saying that you're not wanting to pay or you're ignoring his emails. He's got no response in this email, that email, this email. He starts naming statutes. And it's basically like a complaint. He starts naming statutes that they violated, usually some kind of misrepresentation, um, usually some kind of, um, I don't have them in front of me, but it's usually, uh, they're supposed to they're supposed to, to respond within a timely matter, uh, any kind of communication that you send out yeah. to the insurance company. Uh, so they put yeah. all these violations and it puts them on notice that they've got 60 days now from the time that this civil remedy notice is filed to respond and to make an offer to settle. Awesome. And they and they know that if they don't respond within 60 days, that's that's bad. They usually do, but they usually respond by saying, "Yeah, no, we're still not paying for this claim." And then the then the then the attorney files the lawsuit. And then in the lawsuit, that's when it's just sort of they sort of do their lawyer things and they have to respond to all kinds of stuff. They submit all kinds of documents, uh, uh, requesting all kinds of documents. The downside to the attorney and litigation process is time. But, yeah. but that being said, as someone who's got a ton of lawsuits going on on a lot of my claims, eh, the attorney sort of handles it. Right, you know, right. you're, you're the roofing expert. And if he needs you for anything, then sure, you might get deposed, but I'm yeah. sure you would, I'm sure you'd freaking crush it in a deposition when an attorney is asking you about the price per shingle. I'm sure you sort of laugh yeah. at him and tell him, like okay. That. And, um, right. and then eventually you settle. So especially if you've done the roof already, what happens is, is a year down the road or a year and a half down the road, you get a call from the attorney and say, Hey Paul, we got to check for you. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, that's the one thing about insurance work. Um, you know, it can't be all that you do as far as like from the roofer's perspective. It's a small part of our business. Uh, it grows with the storms when it hits in your backyard, obviously. 
but um yeah it, the techs trickle in in their own sweet time yeah yeah they trickle in, in their own sweet time or do you even have time for anything else or is it all you're doing all storm work right you don't have time for anything else <laughs> Yeah, no, just since Sally, um, my I know what you have YouTube, time for. Um, what's I know that? What, I know what you have time <laughs> yeah, there's for. There's always time for that. <laughs> Tick t- no, you have time for TikTok. That's, that's right. That's time for. Uh, well, for that's those, because I. <laughs> for those that do not know, go look up right now if you can. And if you're in the car driving, listening to this, then, you know, don't get in an accident. But if you're at home in your office, walk watching this you have you can go on your phone get the tiktok app which everybody has since COVID anyway and i want you to learn a uh, search uh, correct me if i'm wrong viking tower one yeah viking tower viking one. tower that viking tower okay viking, viking tower. tower one is instagram yeah Ah, okay. Tower. But forget instagram instagram is instagram is, is whatever you guys gotta go on the tiktok account yep. Paul's got over 100,000 followers on TikTok. That's right. <laughs> just listen to this guy. You can they, just hear they it love in the his Viking. Voice. They love the Viking on there. <laughs> so, uh, dude, what the hell? Tell me about that. What the hell? I think I remember you telling me that. Well, I, that I joined in May, like a lot of. I joined in May. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I joined in May. Um, just to kind of, uh, they wouldn't let me like anything. I was watching videos for several months and uh, I started my account like five or six times and just can't closed it because nobody ever liked anything. Nobody ever saw any of my videos. And I thought, well, I'm a, I told my daughter, I said, one more time, I'm going to open up this account and I'm going to become famous on TikTok. <laughs> and um, she goes, dad, that's not how it works. So I got on there and uh, for a couple of months only had like 300 followers. And then I did a TikTok that went viral for a voicemail that's been seen over a million times. And <laughs> it just went from, you know, 300 to 3,000 to 5,000 to 30,000 to 50,000. And now I'm like at 103, 104,000 followers. And um, it's awesome, man. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> We're gonna play that. By the way, I, I'm, I'm doing a timestamp right now. We're gonna we're gonna play that uh, that voicemail on air. <laughs> nice. It's for a busy working woman, and you know what's really great about that? Thousands of women from all over the world said that is the voicemail when you call their phone. You hear my voice say leaving their voicemail, and um, I even had several people pay for a specific special version of it. Oh my God, that's crazy. Um, yeah, people have sent me money to do voicemails and all kinds of stuff to do um, reading of uh, books that they wrote, um, beard companies, everything. Like it's, I've got merch on there now. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm about to launch a whole Viking Tower line. <laughs> Are you really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yep. know, by the end of February, we'll have the Viking Tower line. I already have one for a unicorn uh, gang that's about love and uh, unity. And um, so you can go on there and buy my unicorn merch right now. So you've got you've got Viking Tower merch yeah. coming Viking. out in February. Yeah, coming, coming out in February. Do you have a website? Uh, it's called coming out in February. Yeah. No, the web, the website, you have a website. I don't have a, no, I don't have a website. I have um, a place where you can like a merch link where you can uh-huh. go buy merch for um, uh, like this unicorn gang that I started where it's about one love, one faith, one, one love, uh, one race. It's about unity. And um, I started that and uh, it did really well. And then people started sending me videos where they were buying my merch in England and all over the country, all over the world. It was really cool. <laughs> So but, wait, um, so wait, it's a unicorn brand. That's the brand name is unicorn. And, uh, and, the what's the one love and with unity? What is that? I don't understand. Yeah, it's a uh, one, it's a uh, one voice because of my voice. That's what everybody started listening to me for was my voice. So we're one voice, one love, one race. And it was just about, about, because of all the stuff that's been going on in the media about every, everybody hates each other and all the racism. And, um, I was just kind of doing it as a, as a joke. And then someone said, Hey, you should run a contest for someone to design your logo. And like I made this gang sign that looks like a unicorn, just goofing around on TikTok, you know. And then somebody drew that, and then they made it into graphic art, and we put it on T-shirts, coffee mugs, everything. Like so, you can go to Society Six, and you can put it on a rug, you can put it on a wall hanging, you can put it on a hat, you can put it on everything. I, I wear masks that has that this symbol on, on it right awesome. here for keeping the germs out. 
So, that's amazing. Yeah, it was crazy, man. Just from me goofing around on TikTok. I mean, that's this started in May. By July or August, I already it was just crazy. So yeah. Social media is powerful, isn't it? Oh man, and it's so much fun, man. I have talked to people from all over the world and like really good friends. Like we're not just acquaintances. I mean, these are people I talk to all the time and interact with and support the um, and people. I have just seen it as a wonderful tool to um, reach out and encourage people. Everybody needs encouragement. I do some like uh, um, meditation TikToks. I do a lot of encouragement. It's always uplifting, always positive. You know, do I do funny voices and stupid? I sing. I've never sung. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. And you're doing it from the comfort of your own home, so you don't have to worry about it. You know. You want to? You, you want to sing? You want to sing for us? <laughs> I can't think of a song, but. <laughs> Oh, man. I do Tennessee whiskey, man. You ought to come into one of my lives. It's a lot of fun. I do karaoke for them. Anyway. I mean, it's it's just crazy how, how I mean, I, I feel you. It's the same thing for me. I remember when I first started doing it, I would get messages messages from people and you know that when you're when you're you know when we were younger back in the day when the internet started i remember my parents would always be like be careful you don't know who you're talking to on the other side that's just whatever it's not a real person you know and i used to sort of have that in the back of my mind but these are real people that message you and that message us you know these are real people with real concerns with real issues that are going in for me it's all public adjusting questions and and they're actual i get messages all the time paul uh thank you for your videos so much because of your videos i decided to stop being a, a, a an insurance company adjuster and i'm going to go do a public adjusting i had this other one this guy doesn't know how to read he doesn't know how to write so he's got this special computer where he's able to sort of dictate everything and he called me and he's just like thank you so much for your videos i don't know how to read and write but i want to know if there's a way that maybe you can help me or whatever because i like to become a public adjuster Adjuster. I want to be an advocate and I want to do this. Just people sort of like, just like making life changes. Cause I've made several videos where I say public adjusting is the greatest job in the world. And everybody's just like that video made. And when you, that video you made about being the, uh, about it being the greatest job in the world, I've decided to take the leap and I really want to do it now and go full time. And it's, it's so freaking cool. Yeah. One of the things that I really love about it is like, you have all this energy and you have all this positivity and it just exudes from you. And that's what you were talking about. Like you teaching young people and you teaching other people now, like you have this energy where you're passionate and that energy where you're passionate, it helps other people find their passions. You know, I was, I did a, a just a TikTok. where I didn't have that many followers and I talked about eating healthier and, 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 you know, treating yourself right. Cause I was up at the gym, you know, I was going to the gym at five o'clock in the morning. And then, you know, two months later, somebody messages me and says, Hey, I, I've lost 40 pounds because of that video. You know, like I just needed a turning point on that day. So when you're out there putting out all this positive stuff, man, then it's just something, somebody, even the algorithm, it's like you're in front of people that need to be in front of you, <laughs> that so you crazy. need to be in front of at the right moment, at the right time. And then boom, their whole life goes in a different direction. It's awesome, man. I actually had someone, you know, write me and say that they were thinking about taking their life and then they saw one of my videos. And on that day, it just changed their perspective. And they were able to make it through and then get some help and then start trying to, to work through and do better. And for me, it doesn't get any better than that. That's like the highest level of like of living for me is to help somebody that's hurting that way. So what yeah, it's the, been fantastic, man. What's what's uh just to be, I guess, a little bit more clear, what's the kind of exact like what's the kind of content that you're putting out? What is it that is it just pretty much anything, anything well, I mean, random that comes to your head? Well, it's it can be random stuff, but I also do like um, you know, like self care, like um, you know, one day I might be, I might get up like I did a whole, I did a night where I did like, um, where we talk about manifesting your future, where you write down everything you want to see, like some people call it a vision board or a dream board. And I, I talked about doing that. And then people are like, well, Hey, I'm going to do that. You know, I need to get my life together. I need to start thinking about my future, you know? So it's something positive there. And then, you know, like I get up and I'm, you know, I'm, I want to do a positive meditation about maybe some breathing exercises. I'll do a video about that. You know, one time I did a video on fat bottom girls making the TikTok <laughs> world go around because I like fat bottom girls. And it was, it got seen over like 250,000 times. <laughs> you know, I never know what people are going to like, but I mean, fat bottom girls are in, in case anybody wanted to know. Um, <laughs> silly stuff like that. But even that was like uh, funny, you know, like people like the content because you never know. Like I'm, you might turn on my TikTok and see me doing some ridiculous voice. 
because I've done voices my whole life and it could be a Frenchman, it could be a cartoon character and who knows what I'm going to say because I'm wild like that. And uh, so, but it's always positive, man. You know, you're never going to get on there and see some stuff that's going to make you feel down, you know? Right, right. What's your, uh, what's the plans? You got any, any, not plans, uh, who has plans, right? But what are some of the things that well, you see? Brother, actually, we just started our own company. What? Well, like my brother and I, we started a company called Viking Towers LLC. And um, we're, we're doing some management. We're doing a lot of roofing uh management and and uh, even with this insurance stuff you know trying to help people i want to expand that i want to do more teaching um i want to help people you know learn what i learned uh you know if we had if every roofer had this knowledge that i have on how to help people with claims and then how to get a public adjuster involved then we could offer services everybody you know it's like uh weapons you know you, you have a lot of different weapons in your hand you're not sure what kind of weapon you're going to need for that day and the more you know weapons we could put in the roofer's hand to help people um you know in storms in florida being a roofer you're going to get work you're going to have a lot of work but you, what if you what if you could do more than just put a roof on what if when you met with somebody and they were having a problem you knew an adjuster you could refer I think that's really big. I think like teaming up with you and being able to refer an adjuster that you recommend is super important because I know they're going to be vetted and they're going to be good people with similar energy. I don't want to just hand them a random, I saw a guy's name on a you know post somewhere and then I'm going to entrust my customer to that guy. That guy might be a jerk or he might be whatever. So networking with other people and growing this network so that we can inc increase the business. And then on my personal side with my own merch and I'm doing more with voice acting, uh, I've gotten a lot of opportunity and some offers to do some voice acting. And I, I like to do some of that and, um, ex, you know, expand the streams of income for me. That's and, what it's uh, all about. That's what it's about. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to see how many different ways I can make money. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, some it, side it, hustles with the business and. Yeah, man, if you're able to make money online, I mean, it's what I tell my team all the time. I mean, ultimately, it's like you. I mean, I know, I know. again, I know you're, you're a passionate guy, so you find the passion in helping others and putting on their roofs and helping them get the money that they need from the insurance company and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, you know, what we're doing is a service industry and it takes up a lot of our time. If that's there's right. a way that we could still have that service industry as our sort of, you know, full-time gig, but find a way that we could sort of make money while we're doing that or make money over here while we're traveling or that's make right. money over here while you and right. i are talking you know that's the way to do it and that merch idea that's, that's right. really good stuff right. so so you've got the one love one voice and uh one race i think that's that's freaking phenomenal one of the things that we were talking about was just the the whole idea of just bringing people together right and uh there's no reason why i mean i call it I, me personally i call it don't be a dick I don't right. think there's any reason for why anybody should be a dick or an asshole to anybody which is a right. reason why I think for me, honestly, it's one of the things that have made me successful in the insurance claim uh, business is that I'm not in it to, to fight with these guys. You know, I'm not in it. Thankfully, we live in a state where we've got alternative dispute resolutions where we could file appraisal, we yeah. could file mediation, or we could file a lawsuit. So when I go out there and meet with these guys, I'm just like, dude, you know, do what you gotta do. Write up what you gotta write up. Uh, but let's try to get along, get along with all the appraisers so I'm able to get sort of what I want. And I think we should just live in a world where we are, I'm gonna buy one of your shirts. That's what I want to do. <laughs> awesome. Is that what it is that what it says? So it's one love, one one voice, one race. Yep, yep. That's what we have out now. That's on the merch link on uh, TikTok. It's really I've really good stuff. I've, so I've been, I want to work with somebody local though that can make the make the merch for me. I've been to Thailand. I've been to Vietnam. I've been to Cambodia. I've been to Kenya. I've been to. Tanzania. I've been to a lot of Europe. I'm not trying to brag right now. I just want to reiterate the fact that, yeah, man, we're all humans. Does it yeah. matter what color? Does it matter what language? One thing I realized when I went to uh, when I went to Thailand, and the first time I went to Thailand, I felt like I was in another world. Everybody just looked differently. Because when you go to Europe, you know, a lot of our ancestors are from Europe. And it's mainly, you know, white race where everybody just sort of, you know, looks European. We all sort of look European. When you go to Thailand yeah. and people look so much different than you do, and you realize when you're going up to a shopping mall and the person in front of you opens a door for you, or you drive 
drop something and they help you and they pick it up for you, you realize, wait a minute, there's a lot of common little subtleties that actually just are, are all the same. We might like some different foods and stuff, or we just have a different language, but for the most part, uh, you walk into somebody's home, they're going to be hospitable. You know, they're not going to just kick you out of the house. And that's no matter where you are. Some of the nicest people that I met were in Kenya. I mean, like super nice. And there was not one billboard or not one uh, advertising that I saw that had a white person on it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I've done just like you. How I came about this one voice, one race, one love is I've traveled all over the world doing um, compassion uh, projects and um, ministry work. And uh, my whole point, my, my whole uh, point when I went on these different missions or different tours was not to make everybody believe the way that I did, but to show people that I had love for them and that it was unconditional and that I was there not because I thought they were wrong and I was right, but because I loved them. And I wanted them to know that someone in the world loved them enough to travel five, 10,000 miles to try to help them. And so, I found uh, the Sikh people in India um, were amazing, uh, filled with love. I went to Africa like you did, and uh, the Nigerians, everywhere I went in Nigeria, someone said, you are welcome here. And we don't greet foreigners that way. We don't greet strangers that way. And everybody in their culture did that. Then I went to China, I went to Beijing, Kuming, Hong Kong, same thing. They treated me, because I'm six foot eight, and because I'm so big, they would just yell, they would just yell NBA, NBA. And then they would give me free stuff. So I really love China. I got a, the most free desserts I've ever gotten anywhere in the world in China. How dare you like China? How dare you? <laughs> I loved it. How the dare Chinese you say people that? were awesome, man. And then I went to India and I was on St. Thomas um, Mount. And I must have got my picture taken with thousands, thousands of people because of my size. They thought maybe I was a wrestler or I was somebody famous or whatever. So I'm all over, um, Europe, I mean, all over Asia in somebody's photo. And no one knows why. They don't know why. They have no idea why. And uh, maybe because someday I'll just be known for spreading love all over the world. But it, anyway, I just, people are good people. I everywhere. know. Most There's people. everywhere. Yeah. Anywhere you, you can, go. You, you choose which one you want to be. Yes, you do. Nobody makes you an asshole. You decide to be an asshole. Something bad happened to you that was out of your control. That's not on you, but how you respond to it, that's on but, you. And that's how I live my you know, life. You got, you got a lot of people that they had, you know, you can't totally blame them sometimes either. You've had some people that just had sort of rough, rough upbringings, you know? I mean, there's been some, I mean, there's some nasty things that I've, that I've heard about, about what yeah. some people have gone through, you know, and they're, they're yeah. very jaded. It's affected them tremendously, but there's also well, a lot I've, of people who have gone through a lot of those things who have been able to overcome it. That's me. And uh, I've been through a lot. And, uh, you know, people want to go toe to toe with, you know, how bad they've had it. And, you know, for me, it's been a gift because I could have been the biggest asshole, you know, self-centered, self-righteous person. But because of all of my pain, it's um, we use a term when I would teach about um, river stones are always smooth because of all the current and all the grading of the sand and the power of the river just washing over it all the time until it's a smooth stone. And I just feel like in our lives, if we looked at all of these difficult situations as a process of smoothing us down so that all of our rough edges are gone, rather than something just terrible always happening to us, if we could, if we could somehow respond with compassion and mercy because of all these other people around us that are going through the same things, then it could, we could really make a difference. The world could be a different place to live. So that's what, I'm, that's what my whole movement is about. And it's funny because I got to share that because I said something stupid on TikTok. <laughs> yeah pretty much but that's not how we met it wasn't through TikTok. <laughs> no 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 but i mean you know it's just like um everything happens for a reason right everything like i believe even like when you put out good energy like that and you're always trying to do the right thing you're always trying to help people that good energy comes back to you man and yes. uh, and you get a voice you know, you get a place to say what you want to say because you, you believe way, the way that you believe there needs to be more people like you that are successful that can reach and, and impact multiple thousands of people because we need that right now. We need unity and we need everybody to work together and we need insurance companies to do right by the people they insure and we need everybody to get a fair shake and that's why we're here. I wish, I wish. I, I mean, I, t I tell the adjusters all the time. I'm like, just come on guys. Like what's, what's the deal here? And the problem is, is it's big business like anything else. It's a for-profit business. It ain't no non-profit 
business. You know what I'm saying? And one of their biggest expenses, unfortunately, is claim payouts. So they have to find different ways that they could just uh, underpay here, underpay there, 325 per square here, uh, detach and reset here, minor repair to that, that part of the roof over there, one coat of paint over here. And it's, it's a fact, it's a fact that they have, they have people looking into all those things, making sure that they're cutting it, just underpaying it here and there. I'm not saying anything new. I'm not saying anything derogatory whatsoever. It's just, it's a fact that, you know, they underpay here and there. And when you've got 65% of people not disputing any of it and just accepting that payment, I mean, it's, it's in their best interest to underpay just a little bit. You add that up and you multiply that by millions of, of homeowners and millions of policies, that's billions of dollars that they're saving. Well, think about this, and you've probably explained, explained this process before, but a hurricane hits and an insurance company hires 200 adjusters. Of those 200 adjusters, maybe 25 have experience. I mean, really good adjusters with good experience. And that's a high number. So if you look at 175 adjusters, maybe they all just got their license in the last two years. They have no real field experience and they go for a three hour class or maybe even a two day class with an insurance company. And then you release them into the field. And I saw, it's just like every business. You got overachievers like me and you that are gonna try to do you know, A-level work the first day on the job and they're gonna do whatever they can to get it right. Then you got people that barely show up and they're there to get a paycheck. And from that overachiever to the guy that's barely there, to get a paycheck is sent out into the storm. And so of those 175, think about if a 10% were, are, are the go-getters, that's about 18 adjusters. Now what you're dealing with is you got 150 or so adjusters that are mid-level to sorry, a lot of them will not be asked back. A lot of them will never return to another storm because they do such a bad job. And they're out writing estimates for people who just lost everything. Everything. And so they, they'll write a check for $7,000 and the insured sometimes thinks, well, that's a lot of money. They have no idea. My insurance company did me a good job. Not when I go behind them and write it for 52000 or thirty. 30- 7,000. Like there's so much money that's left on the table. And after I watched the process one time in my first storm, I said, I've got to get on the other side of this because this is wrong. This is, this is built in where the insurance companies, because of how they do this and how they hire, will leave millions, if not billions of dollars on the table that insured should have had. And they do that. Think about that in every storm. And that's just one insurance company with one, you know, group right. of 200. Right. There are thousands of adjusters that they're, they're sending into the storm that absolutely are suck at what they do or have no training or, or just don't have the right experience or don't learn very quickly. And so there's so much money left on the table. And that's why I want to encourage everybody, get a public adjuster, somebody that knows what they're doing, that has experience or works for someone that has a lot of experience and get what you're supposed to get from the insurance company. Because you're, the insurance companies are not here to do you any favors, but you pay your premiums on time and they're supposed to pay out what they owe you when you're hurting. And I, that just doesn't get done the right way. And so I love uh, what you're doing. And I love what I'm doing because we get to help people who are getting the raw end of the stick, the raw end yeah. of the deal for sure. Yeah. Uh, and you can multiply that by even more, too, because you're talking just about the guys that you meet or girls that you meet out in the field. You've got the desk adjusters, too, who are just sitting behind a desk looking at some photos, and they're ultimately making a lot of the decisions here. And then what happens, Paul, is that if they're, they, everything that they pay out is looked at by a supervisor, and that supervisor has another supervisor, and at the end, they get audited and they get looked at how many, how much they've paid out in claims over the past month or two months. And they've got a ratio. Every claim, every insurance company has a ratio that they need to be careful with. I forgot what it's called, but I, I'm actually studying it. I guess I should remember for a course that I'm doing. Uh, but there's a, a some kind of ratio that, and it's 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 yeah. it, it, premium incomes and claim payouts. And they have to keep this certain ratio at a certain point. And if they get past this, they have to start cutting back on claim payouts. It's just, a, it's, it's a fact. It's a, again, yeah, it's a business. Well they, and they put a reserve. They decide how much they're gonna spend basically on the on what they think the damage is. And think about it if, if uh, now it just, this, this will blow your mind. Think about if you were allowed to, the, they were allowed to hire surgeons like this that didn't have to, you know, they went to school, <laughs> but they didn't have any experience and they, He would say to you, your surgeon may can remove your leg. Maybe he can't. Maybe he's never removed a leg. I don't know. We're going to just let him cut your leg off. We really don't care. Um, There's a lot of surgeons. You know, these guys, they got their surgery license or whatever. And they. so systemically, the insurance companies have built in a way not to pay what they owe. And don't don't you think that's wrong? 
Uh, there's not enough lobbying about that in the state, in the United States. It's a there, systemic issue that needs to be addressed. We need better. We need a better payout system. Everybody that's a new um, adjuster should be audited, um, uh, not the not dependent on the adjuster, but because of a training, you know, training um, opportunities. But um, people need to be paid properly. And uh, the way the storms are set up is that there's, the insurance companies are the only one that win. Is this your uh, is this your first major storm, Paul? Um, no, uh, I started. I went. Um, I, I worked Michael with uh, the owner of our company. And I worked Michael from both sides. I worked Michael first uh, for a major carrier. You know, I'm not going to get into names. And uh, but we, I worked in um, North Carolina and in Georgia. And um, Georgia was devastated along the same route that um, uh, Panama City was because the storm just kept going. You know, it went through Florida and then went up through Georgia, Donaldsonville. You know, I had one uh, one house that was had uh, 72 trees down on covered structures. There were hundreds of trees down, but 72 was on a covered structure, either A, B, or C coverage, depending on how it went. And um, so I saw the large loss stuff that happened because of Michael, but I saw it in Georgia. Then I saw just how lost everybody was and their policies. They didn't know what was going on. And then after I finished my deployment, I came back and worked for a year in Panama City selling roofs and helping people with their insurance claims. And uh, man, it was that was so rewarding because people were really being taken advantage of in that storm. They just so, adjusters didn't know what they were doing. So you worked on the other side. You mentioned earlier that you were you were an adjuster for the other side. Yeah, I, I worked as an adjuster um, for the whole deployment. I worked it in Georgia. And then when I got done with that, I went to work for the roofing company and um, helped people with their, you know, file their claims and get their, their roofs paid for. But um, back before they changed the law, I would write for everything I saw just like an adjuster. And they would be leaving twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on the table because the adjuster didn't know what they were doing. They came out and... Uh, you know, wrote for some repairs and went into the next house and wrote for some repairs and got their 250 bucks or whatever and went to some next house and wrote for some repairs. Are you talking about, were, you're talking about your time as an insurance adjuster or when you were starting selling roofs? Well, I'm, I'm talking about when I was selling roofs, um, when we would go into the storm areas and someone would say, well, I don't have money for a roof. And I'd say, well, you know, here's four laws that, that would allow you to get a roof and you, you, you know, two of them you, you uh, qualify for. And um, then I read all the statutes in Florida and I memorized them and I memorized the Supreme Court decisions about O&P. And so like, I just became like a walking, you know, thesaurus about insurance work. And as I would go to get these roofs, I would say, you know, did they write for your cement that's busted up? Did they write, write for your tree remo removal? Did you get paid for the work that you did? Because you can get paid for the time that you put in. You don't have to pay somebody else to do it because your time is also valuable. And having those kind of conversations with people and then just watching their eyes light up and be like, are you telling me that my insurance company should have paid for this, this or that? And they didn't pay for that? Oh, yeah. And, um, and uh, at the time, I'd write for all of that stuff, and then I'd manage it. We'd do all of it. We'd do everything, and we'd get a contractor involved sometimes, and we would do we would manage everything, not just the roof. And uh, it helped a lot of people get paid in that storm. Very rewarding. Very rewarding for Michael. So, Tell me about how did you make the switch so fast? Tell me about your time as, uh, as the insurance adjuster. Tell me a little bit about that and why you made the switch so fast. I mean, I could only assume what your answer is going to be. But I was president and C. Well, well, I was president and CEO of an organization for 10 years, and I wanted to retire from that where I was doing compassion projects, and it was all 501c3 work. So I got my adjuster's license, and uh, because I met with a guy in, in Mobile, a friend of mine, he said, I think that's what you should do. You like to help people. Um, you're smart. You pick up things quickly. You'll, you won't have any problem with it. I got deployed at Florence in North Carolina when that, that storm hit, and uh, – um, kind of got my, 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 um, you know, got my nose wet, learned a little bit, started picking up a lot of things. And then by the time Michael hit, which was the next week, I was in my second deployment. We worked 15 hours a day, six and seven days a week for 31 days. Brutal. And when that was over by the end of that storm, they had given me the large loss, um, uh, claims because of a good job I was doing. And then I would sit in the office with all the higher ups of the insurance company and I was writing, you know, one hundred, two hundred thousand dollar losses by the end of that second storm. And the company I was with, I made the top twelve in the company. They asked me to come back for special training after that. And then I got special attention and special training. So what I learned from those two storms, because I when I observed things very quickly and pick up on things very quickly, I saw 
what I just talked about, how it was built in, the, the, insured, the insured wasn't getting a fair shot. And the insurance companies were relying on that. And I saw how poor the adjusters were. They were out in the field and what terrible job they were doing. And I was already going on behind those adjusters in my own company and rewriting their, their adjustments. They started sending me out to go behind people. And I had just started. This is my second storm. And I'm already auditing other adjusters. And um, I just remember sitting in a room one time with uh, one of the higher ups for the company we were working with. And he's going over, it was my second large loss claim I sent in, it was over $100,000. And it, he didn't have one correction on it. He, you know, he said this, I've never seen anything like this. And I'm not trying to brag about it, I'm just saying I picked it up quick. And um, he, he said, this is exactly what we're looking for. And he used it as an example to, for the whole group that we were with. And, and even with all of that, what I didn't like about it is, is I could see that there was only maybe uh, two or three people in that whole hundreds of adjusters that could do that. And, and what really got me about that is, what about the, all the other people that they were helping? Everybody had 50 claims. Right. So a thousand claims, you got the bottom 10% of the people writing for you. And I thought, how many dollars? I mean, I started doing the math. The insurance company was saving by hiring these, you know, new adjusters and then auditing them, auditing them and correcting some of their work. How many millions of dollars people didn't get in that storm because of the way the system is designed. And I wanted to be on the other side of that system. Nice. I just don't want to be a part of that, you know? And as much as I enjoy being a part of it because I could help the, the insured, I could just help one person at a time, just a little bit at a time versus, you know, now, you know, I'm on here talking about it. I want to help a lot of people, you know, get, get paid. They need to get paid. It's wrong what the insurance companies are doing and somebody needs to make them pay. And it's funny too, because you can, you can't even like tell the desk adjusters or the field adjusters, Hey, I used to be an adjuster. It's like, they don't care. It's like, you just got to present your estimate as best you can. But uh, cause I was going to say, you should try to use that to your advantage, but uh, that probably doesn't matter. It's still, they're going to still do what they do. Well, I mean, I told them, you know, like, uh, I, on, I was dude. an adjuster. I made the top adjusters in our company. Um, you know, I went through Xactimate. I, I, I did all my CE for Xactimate right away instead of waiting a year or two or whatever because I wanted to get really good at it. And um, I mean, I'm not that great at it now. I haven't. I've just done many roofs for the last you know year and a half. But it's it's something that you know. I tell them, listen, if I was if I came to this house now, there are houses right now in this storm. I would have bought the roof from the road. I mean, it's that obvious, <laughs> right? You know, when you, you know, you look at the roof and you go, well, okay, shit, it's obvious. that's, that's that. I mean, how many, I could take a picture from space and buy this roof, <laughs> you know, I don't need to write chalk outlines on it. You know, it's a dead body. It's a dead body. You know, right. I need a coroner, you know, it's what I'm like, I don't need the whole lot of, you know, a special test to run on this. <laughs> and they're saying, well, we got a new CEO and the new CEO has a new algorithm and this algorithm um, only accounts for 22 shingles and there's 800 shingles on it. And so if you do the math, you're at like two you're at to 0.04% and we're not going to get to 25%. Like, you know what? I hope when you guys get a, a, a class action lawsuit, I hope you remember me because I would definitely love to be a part of the people that, um, am, uh, deposed. Like you said, I let wanna, me uh, send me your list of umpires so I could go ahead and review them real quick. And I'm going to send you a list of attorneys that you might want to get in. You might want to get involved with. Yeah. Awesome. Because this is, yeah. I mean, I feel, yeah. I know what you're going it's through. Just, um, it's annoying. What's some of the, what's up uh, besides that one, because that was a good one. Uh, what are some of the other, other just wild and crazy shit that you've heard them tell you to try to tell you that it's not valid and it shouldn't be replaced. Oh, it shouldn't be replaced. Oh, it didn't pass. Uh, it passed the brittle test. It's not brittle <laughs> enough. I'm like, you know, we just made that up. Like that was a test that somebody made up and it's not an industry standard and it won't hold up in court. There's not a real thing about it. But if you want to talk about it, I can explain to you why when I start taking up these shingles, it's going to bleed into the shingles around it. And then once we get that, it's going to bleed in. So now, now we have to tie it into, you can't just tie it and you have to, now you have to redo the ridge cap. So when you, when you pull up the ridge cap, there's a good chance you're going to start damaging the shingles on the other side. Right. I mean, as, you, as a roofer, you really don't know as an adjuster until you've been a roofer and you've seen it. And I, I have seen a lot because I was out in the field on, on, you know, inspecting the jobs when I started with the company before I went full time with the insurance work. And I was the guy that went behind the roofers and, and I went to every, a repair that we did and I 
uh, learn to um, do repair estimates. But because I speak English and roofing Spanish, which is my joke, I speak fluent roof. Como va el trabajo? How is the job coming? Uh, there you go. Uh, because of that, I w- they would want you know somebody to come out and be present. And I would watch these guys as they start to do repair on these older roofs, just it just start bleeding. And they'd say, "Oh, I'm not doing a repair on this roof." Why not? Because I know it's I can't I can't yeah. the shingles are too old or they're too worn out or they're too do whatever and I'm just going to make a mess up there so when you sit down with a, an adjuster they don't know I've had adjusters uh, I'll give you one for instance I had six adjusters to see in a day the first adjuster didn't get on the roof just handed me their camera asked me to take pictures for them okay which is fine I'd already marked up the roof chalked it up the whole thing the second adjuster um, wanted to um, fly their um, drone the drone right but because we were too close to the air brace it, they couldn't go no, in the wow. airspace so she gave me her i took all the pictures for her i did that that happened with five adjusters in a row it wasn't until the sixth adjuster they actually got on the roof and did their job so i mean i was happy about that because they were letting me basically just buy the roofs because right. you know i did all the work on them um so i've just seen a lot of you know a lot of nonsense with the, you know, the biggest thing that I saw in this storm was was uh, talented adjusters that have been with the um, adjusting for 25 years. One one guy was a roofer before he was an adjuster, so he had more experience within me. And I'm not ashamed of meeting people that are better than me. It's something. Uh, this guy was obviously somebody I would think would be much better than me at, at what he was doing. And he said I would buy the roof, but my insurance company won't let me. Right. And he explained. I get why. that a lot. I would buy the roof, but my insurance company won't let me. Very common. That's not acceptable. I, 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 a 25 year veteran saying I can't buy the roof because my insurance company won't let me. You know and how that, many messages I get from insurance adjusters asking me about public adjusting and how they're interested in jumping to becoming a public adjuster because they're tired of shit like that? Yeah. This storm, I, and I won't say the company's name, but there were three companies that every adjuster I met with said this was their last house. We're not, the insurance companies weren't buying the roofs like they're supposed to. And, um, and that's a, that's a shame. That's a shame. They, wait, the only people you, are get hurt. You cut out there a little bit. You said that there was, you're not going to mention any insurance company names, but there was what? There were three, three different companies where insurance adjusters, because I was meeting with five, six, seven, eight adjusters. They were like, I'm done. I'm not, this is my last roof or I'm going to finish the 10 that I have. And then I'm going I'm home. Done. I'm not going to even do stay behind and, and do any re audits or anything. I mean, really talented guys, people that had real pedigrees with adjusting work. I'm out. Um, the insurance company should buy the roof center or not. So. Cause they're yeah. just sick and tired of it. Yeah. They're not, the, the insurance companies are not operating above board. And they're not buying the roofs that they need to buy. What did you find when you were, uh, did you say you were working as an insurance adjuster in Georgia or did you, in Alabama, or did you say that you were? Georgia, yep, Georgia and North Carolina. Were you selling roofs there too? No, no. Oh, uh, okay. No. Because I'd like to know what are some of the, because I know I think in Georgia, like the matching statute doesn't apply. So if, if the shingles don't match, you can't really use that argument. Uh, but you mentioned how uh, if, if you damage one shingle, then you have to replace the other shingles. If you get to the ridge cap, if you replace the ridge cap, then that's going to damage the other side as well, the other side of the the other slope. Uh, are, are there are there arguments like that that you've had to use? In, in Florida, not so much. But I know like in, in Texas, uh, two slopes don't have to match. Yeah. But there's arguments that need, that need to be used – when you're replacing, you know, one side and you get all the way to the edge that you're going to damage the other side, which means it'll have to be addressed. Does that make sense? Th- those really arguments are the really, yeah, absolutely. But those arguments really do work in Florida or should work in Florida for the 25% rule or for the matching law. I mean, there, there are reasons why those things apply in Florida. They did not apply in North Carolina. They did not apply in Georgia. Right. Um, there was a whole different set of rules and problems. Right. Um, for instance, in Georgia. Um, Georgia's uh, a real pain in the ass. Georgia, the insurance companies have the policyholders by the balls. From what I've heard. Yeah, well, what I learned about this is one of the reasons why I, I thought about I wanted to become a public adjuster, or at least get in on the other side of it, which I'm able to do now with the roofing company. Um, but the reason why I wanted to get in on that is because in, in uh in North Carolina, the laws are, there's no laws to protect the insured there. 
Right. So you can have over insurance there. So they could be still um, paying on a policy for $65,000 worth of an insurance when the mobile home or the, the modular home they live in is now valued at $2,500. And then when the storm hits and because they have an ACV value policy, See, they're only getting twenty five hundred dollars. They're not getting sixty grand to replace the whole mobile home. Right. And I saw the anger and the hurt and the brokenness in the people. And I said, man, I don't want to be this guy. I don't want to work for insurance companies when they're they're um they're following the law in, in North Carolina, but the laws have need to be rewritten. Um, same thing in Georgia, just a different type of scenario that was going on. It was interesting to me. If the house flooded and you lived in a mobile home, they'd pay for your pump because every mobile home had flood coverage. But if you lived in a regular home, there was no flood coverage for you. So certain things, you, you needed a flood if you were in a mobile home, and if you were in a regular home, you needed wind damage. Yeah. It's just interesting to see how the policies were written for different things. And if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong storm, you got nothing. Right. And I just don't think that's fair when everybody's paying premiums for something they don't understand. Right. Well, so, that's the problem is people don't understand. And, yeah. you know, uh, there's just uh, agents don't really explain it very well. You know, one thing that I try to provide, uh, one thing like I have uh, like Andy so that he can, you know, help grow uh, his side of it is to offer offer free advice for people to at least look over their policy and uh, explain to them exactly what their policy reads. You know what I'm saying? So at least, you know, now in your case over there, the storm has already hit. But for people over here in the Tampa area or wherever, or Miami, wherever it is, hey, let me read your policy. Let me take a look at it. I just bought a new house and I just bought insurance. And oh boy, I said, you got to have everything in there. I want it all. Give me everything. All that law and ordinance. I want that. I want I want a 2% hurricane hur- hurricane deductible. I don't want a bit. I, uh, and I, I, they sent me six policies. Five out of the six policies had limitations on water damage and a 5% hurricane deductible. Five out of the six. I'm like, guys, uh, you know me. I, I'm Vince. I'm the public adjuster. Why would you send me this crap when you know I'm not going to take that shit? And then I've got a pool. Right. In the new, I got a pool in the new house. Again, five out of the six uh, policies they sent me didn't include any of that area. It was just an in-home living space. And I'm like, no, no, no. We need all of it. I want That's every right. single thing covered. That's right, because in Florida, it's not if we're going to get hit with a hurricane. Yeah. It's when. Yes, sir. It's when. And uh, if you follow the trends for the last 10 years, there the last 10 years, there's been more financial damage every year for 10 years in a row. So there's more storms that are hitting America uh, than ever before, and they're doing worse damage, and it gets worse every year. And so it, it's not about when. It's a, it, I mean, it's not about if. It's about when. So you need to be prepared. Are you gonna? Are you willing to? Uh, are you gonna expand your company to the point where you're you're gonna start maybe doing and handling different storms all over the country? Is that something that you would consider? Absolutely. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I, well, it's just a, it's so smart. Like uh, my whole thing is systems. <laughs> And, you know, I haven't done roofing long enough to, to develop the perfect system or the system that I think is the least amount of stress with the most amount of payback. Um, we, I hope to do that in the next year. Um, I want to know what should we be doing on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturday with not working on Sunday. And then, you know, try to come up with a system. Here's how you expand from doing five roofs a week to 10 roofs a week to 20 roofs a week, et cetera. And then get all those systems in place. What does it make sense to do more? own your own, let's say, dumpster business or rent dumpsters. It just depends on where you're at. It depends on the size of your company. It depends on your overhead and all that sort of thing. So there's just a lot about it I don't know, but I plan on learning it as quickly as humanly possible and then putting a system together. And um, and then the other thing is the storm system. That's a completely different system. You know, how Hail do you- Hail damage is a big one. Yeah, hail damage is big, but just like the whole process of, I'm learning a lot from this storm on uh, paperwork and how to get things paid in a timely manner. And uh, man, when I, re- when I get hit that sweet spot, I will be letting everybody know. Have you heard of Storm Ventures Group? Oh yeah, I, watched, I, I learned a lot from them. That's where I got most of my training initially. Yeah. Are you gonna go to the to SVG? Are you gonna go to the uh, to the big event they have in uh, March or April? I think it is over in New Orleans. You should go. Not this year. I don't have any plans to. But yeah, I, I really the SVG um, training is where I got most of what I do. Ah, um, okay. I learned. Yeah, I learned. Um, uh, the owner of the company I work for now bought all the SVG stuff and became part of the SVG group. And um, 
and that was fantastic. It was really, really, really good. Yeah, I just, I just got, I just got involved with them now. So I'm going to be going to that conference tomorrow. I'm actually oh, going nice. tomorrow. I'm going to SRC Storm, Storm, shit. It's called SRC, SRC right. Summit. SRC right. Summit is what it's called. And that's going to be in Texas. But it's a bunch of storm people who just work a lot of storms. I'm trying to get better at it myself, to be completely honest. I mean, yeah. I did I did a little bit of your storm over there. I did uh, pretty heavily Hurricane Michael. And then Hurricane Irma was just like, just absolutely insane. But it's, a, it's a definitely definitely a good business to get it's into. There's a lot of great ideas. and. Um... Oh yeah, well, big time. He, he's um he's got it he's got it figured out for the most he's part. He's got it There's figured out. What he does, and um you know like for me it's like putting putting things into practice. And, Absolutely. Uh, seeing how they work and deploying your you know your own people. Right. You know it's interesting. You can learn from somebody and you can you know have all these great classes and all these great videos and stuff, and then you you meet somebody else and they have a different way of doing everything. Well, you got to figure works. out the. You got to figure out what works for you. What works for you, and for me, it, it's um, it's uh, the least amount of input, the maximum amount of output. Hell you know, yeah! Make it simple. The kiss principle: keep it simple. Keep stupid. it simple, stupid. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Paul, I mean, that was awesome. We only yeah. went an hour. We only went an hour and fifteen minutes. Cool, bro. Um, it just feels like five minutes with you, bro. Ah, get out of here. You with you the same, man. You're 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 fucking awesome. I'm really yeah. really grateful to have met you. Yeah, me um, too, bud. I hope we get to do some more stuff together. I think we will. I think uh, I have a good feeling that we will one way or the other, whether it be through insurance claims or Africa. It's gonna be something. That's right. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, I, we, there's a lot to do, bro. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll definitely collaborate. Uh, send me, uh, send me that list of umpires. I'm gonna send you some attorneys, and also send me, I got, send me a link for your merch. I mean, I guess I gotta go to TikTok to find that stuff. Uh, I can send it to you. Yeah, I can send you a link. Yeah, it's from Society Six. But yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm actually working. I'm trying to uh, figure out a local company that can do the same thing. I went with Society6 because you could literally put it on a million different things overnight. And there's not a lot of money in that for me, um, but getting my own merch line and then having somebody, you know, print it up my, for, for me and sell it directly for me. Is actually oh, they do everything for you? Oh, they do everything. You, I don't do anything. They just send money to my bank account. Do they so, take out a lot of money? All of it. Yeah, it's not really worth it. It just I wanted to get it out there. And I oh, to get, well, that sounds good. You know what I mean? It wasn't <laughs> that part of it was just um, really just to get it out there and get it in the public. Yeah. So you're going to. And then they did. You're going to get out of it and right. You're going to switch to something different now. Well, I'm going to continue to do that. Like you can, I'm learning a lot about social media, about link trees and stuff like that. There will be a time where I can, you can go get that merchandise for the unity and I'll, I'll be spending a lot more mm -hmm. time on that as time uh, comes up in the future, but I'm really working on my own personal, like Viking tower brand because of the voice and because mm -hmm. of all the cool stuff and all the cool people I've met. I've got hundreds and hundreds of people that are telling me, Hey, I'd buy a t-shirt, man, you know? And so I'm we're working one. on a logo right now. So that should be, why haven't, awesome. <laughs> why haven't you hired a virtual assistant? Uh, I really don't know. I, I, what do the I need hell one? are you waiting? Of yeah. course you need one. Yeah. I, I've got, I've got three of them, but I've got one in particular Milan. He's become famous now. He's, I call him the Serbian assassin. He's in, he lives in Serbia and I call him an assassin. And because he's an assassin when it comes to marketing and social media. Nice. And um, I mean, we, we should get together with him and maybe he has some good ideas on how we can help yeah, you. Yeah, you have to tell me more about that, man. Like, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, I, I okay. think we should, we should get with him so you could, we could figure out some stuff for you. Um, I don't know if Milan has time because he's so busy with all of my shit, um, but maybe we could find someone for you who could help you. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it shouldn't cost you too much. Um, but at the end of the day, even if it costs you something, it's going to, at least be valuable for your time right like you said you don't want to have you want to have minimal input maximum output right right by, by coughing up that extra money for an assistant it's going to give you maximum output and it's gonna it, it took me from like from here to here i mean milan knows it i met you because right. of him because he was doing all the linkedin stuff and i was able to meet you like that and um 
I think right. you can easily find somebody who can help you just take over, not take over, but at least help you a lot with that side of the business so that you don't have to do so much. Cause once everything is up the way it's supposed to, that's just going to be a cash machine. Yeah, man. And, and if you could take even a virtual assistant, whether they're in Serbia, the Philippines, China, or whatever it is, you could still offer them maybe a small little percentage. So they feel like they got some skin in the game and they're going to do whatever yeah. they can for you. Yeah. I'd have no problem with that. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. let's get let's yeah. get together yeah. with Milan. Where, so where did you find that? Yeah, please. Yeah, let's Up, do that. Upwork. Yeah. Upwork.com. Okay. Let me write that down. What you do is you want to basically put a description of, let's say, like a virtual assistant that is a, uh, I don't know, uh, social media marketing. And uh, well, you're doing um, merchandise sales. You're doing something different. Uh, so you want to find a description online uh, of, of the type of person that you're looking for and the type of things that you need them to do. Be as specific as possible. And then you basically put that into Upwork. It's going to come up with a bunch of different candidates. I would recommend personally, and you as a world traveler would have, would understand put out of the U S cause you're going to save right. a lot of money that way and um, right, right. get somebody who's willing to work for you. And what's it called? Upwork. U P W O R K. Okay. Upwork is where you're going to find really, 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 really good candidates. Awesome. I can't wait, man. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah. We're going to help each other out one way or the other. I'm really hoping. I'm really hoping that awesome, when buddy. I, I'm really hoping that when I extract this thing, that there's no freezing. Praying. <laughs> well, worst case scenario, we have to do it again sometime. Yeah, you see. All right, <laughs> he's coming back. Yeah. All right, Paul. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you. I'm very grateful to know you, and uh, yeah, I'm, here, I'm looking forward to growing this relationship. And uh, we'll have this thing out hopefully soon. I'll let you know. Uh, I mean, whatever. It's uh, it's. I don't shouldn't be saying this. Whatever. It's Friday, but we're gonna put it out on Wednesday. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll send you the link and everything. Sounds fantastic, man. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend, Paul. Bye. See you later.